Hello out there. I got another journal club. Just cranking these out lately. Journal Club 25. <clears throat> I actually like these journal clubs for me, if anything. I'm kind of selfishly motivated. Um, just because I want to um, understand research a little better when I read it. And, and there's nothing like teaching, right, to understand. So I always tell my students, if you teach it to somebody else, you know, it. you can't fudge it. Like when you're going through this, if I'm looking through the study and there's at times I do and I'm like, ah, I didn't realize that deal, detail it helps me to flesh out the study more. So if you're into reading research and evaluating things, teach it to somebody else and you'll find out if you know it or not. So anyway, uh, if you like this video, like it, by the way, subscribe to my channel. Lots of journal, this is journal club 25. Uh, there's other, there's a book club. There are all kinds of fun stuff going on uh, related to the field of health, uh, health, um, nutrition and training science. All right. So this study, it's on a topic that's a little controversial um, I, in the field. I mean, there's bigger topics, like we're not curing cancer here, right? We're, we're talking about recovery. But this is a, a, a study that uh, came out in 2021, the time I'm recording this, by Wilson et al. And the study is called Cold Water Immersion Offers No Functional or Perceptual Benefit Compared to Sham Intervention During Resistance Training Program. So, you know, hearkening back to my days as a college football player, um, you know, we cold water immersion was the, the way to go, both for injuries and for... Um, you know, recovery, when I thought that if you sat in a cold tub, you would recover faster. And, you know, I, I'm sure those of you who've been along with this field for a while and know all the kind of uh, um, controversy around it and the discussions, um, I will tell up front my bias, and I think it's important you recognize, I do not like ice, um, unless you've severed a limb, uh, which uh, I thought the author, what was that book called, Freeze? Freeze? He's the first guy that kind of came out, and I can't remember his name anymore, um, that started kind of challenging this, and he got on Kelly Sturette's uh, videos and it just kind of took off from there. But basically that blood flow, right? It's all about blood flow and that, um, ice, by the way, there is ice isn't garbage. Ice is a fantastic pain management tool. And that's why it's been so effective. Like that's why we like to do it after we would train because it, it numbs everything. Well, I didn't really like it, but I mean, it does numb things. So when I had an ankle, a, a significant ankle sprain in college, um, I ice after I watched game film, you know, practice film, I'd ice for like 15 minutes. <laughs> no wonder thing never healed. Um, but man, I, I didn't feel anything after felt quote unquote good just because, you know, and then when blood flow was restored as that blood rushed in and, I, and the heat came back into it, it felt really good for a short time. And that's this idea of contrast, which might have some value. So I, I think we need to be careful not to go the other way and say ice is garbage. Cold water has no effect. You know, cold water immersion could be effective. Um, I, from what I've seen is if there's a thermal load, right? So if, if you're doing two a days and you don't care about, um, you know, potentially, uh, recovery in terms of like muscle mass building or strength or whatever, you know, uh, cold water immersion may be effective. So that's my kind of biases up front. Um, and this article kind of supports my bias, so I guess that's okay, but I do want to make my biases up front. And so what the study was, was actually, I like it. Um, I like it. Like, can you like studies? Sure you can. Um, it's not without its problems. Welcome to research. You know, if you've watched any of my videos, you know, I say it all the time, but research is hard. Um, I was impressed though with the, with the, uh, the desire to try to control things in the study. There was a lot of work put into this study. I don't know if this was a master's thesis or something, but um, it, there was a lot of work put into this study in terms of control. And that's a lot of these research studies. That's, that's the pain in the butt is you have to, you know, you don't have to, but you know, if you, you can try to control everything to try to tease out. So you're not affirming the consequent, right? You don't say, well, this happened because of this. It's like, well, I'm going to try to eliminate all these other factors. Like it wasn't nutrition. It wasn't sleep. It wasn't, you know, so on and so forth. All right. So the nuts and bolts of the study is, um, there were uh, 13, right? 13? Thir 13, yeah. 13 healthy men uh, volunteered for the study. Um, they underwent uh, a training protocol. Uh, so the strength, there was a strength block from sessions 1 to 8, and then power block sessions six through uh, 9 through 16. For a total of 8 weeks. During these 8 weeks, they trained twice, twice a week. That's why you know, it works out to 8 weeks. Um, I'm going to leave out some details here. I, I pause the video for a second because I'm like, I make sure I learn. There's, just, I'm gonna. It's a little bit of a cop out, so you're gonna have to do some legwork yourself. I'm gonna leave out a, a little bit of the details in terms of time points, but I am gonna highlight the dependent variables, and it, they even nicely had a header here called dependent variables. That's the outcome measures, right? Muscle soreness, perceived recovery, um, the lifestyle demands of the athlete. They looked at uh, pination angle uh, of the vastus lateralis and wanted to see how that changed. Uh, reactive strength index, peak force, and rate of force development, uh, dual x-ray absorptometry uh, for lean changes in body composition, and um, the one-quarter 4RM, one-quarter squat 4RM, 
Okay, and they, they chose it because it was a safer. Having done research with full squat, I can appreciate doing a quarter squat. You could argue, though, that that isn't really helpful, um, but it's like it's not applicable is what I should say. It's, it is very helpful. Um, but it is what it is, a strength measure. That's a limitation of the study. Okay, but again, having done research with full squat work, that's very difficult because some people say they can squat, and then you can find out they can't or they haven't been there so dang sore they can't move. So the quarter squat um, was a way, uh, I think, to, to safely do a, some sort of strength measurement that was, a, you know, a true strength measurement closer to a 1RM to 4RM in this case. All right, and then the assessments were done of each one of these variables, um, the baseline, of course, and then after the first block, which was, con uh, which was called a strength block and then it was set up accordingly, uh, set up meaning like the programming variables are set up for a strength type of training with the exercises that were selected, uh, and then a post right after the uh, final four week block, which was what they called a power sessions. Right, they they were you know, obviously just that more about velocity movement rather than um, the strength of uh, the strength type focus. Okay, so. Um, I'm leaving out some very important details that you may find, like what was in the program, what was that? Those are very good questions. I'm not going to go over seeing one of those. Sometimes I do that, and sometimes I don't think people care that much. Um, you should, but you're just going to have to go back and see those variables that account for these constructs of power and strength, okay? And for what I looked at over, though, it, it, I, I would buy it. I'd buy that that's strength and that's power of work. How's that? Yeah, if you think my opinion matters, if you want to appeal to authority here, um, I'll be the authority. All right. So what were the... Um, what were the the outcome measures um, in these two? I'm sorry, let me back up. Well, the whole purpose of the study was to, okay, we have all these outcome measures. What happens if uh, you took a cold bath 10, uh, 10 degrees Celsius um, up to the hips? And that's controversial in cold water immersion. Should you go all the way up to your neck, blah, blah, blah. So they selected below the hips, which is a common way to sit in a cold tub, maybe a little bit higher, maybe mid chest. A lot of times it was above the navel, those, those kind of, but I think that's reasonable. Um, so within 15 minutes, uh, they sat in the, the cold tub um, the iliac crust was, I just looking to make sure, ensuring their lower limbs and iliac crust is fully immersed. Okay, just double checking I wasn't lying to you. And then the other group, the sham group, I like this. Um, they were told, so that part of this was, uh, of this project is the uh, individuals took whey protein and it was set to their body weight, which was really good. And that's what I'm saying. There's some details in here. I'm like, wow, you just spent some time to do this, which is great. This is good research, um, does, you know, in terms of the methodology. Um, and I'll talk about the limitations in a little bit here. Uh, but the sham group was told, um, you only, you have a little bit more leucine in your shake more than the cryo group or the cryotherapy or the cold water group. And so they, you know, there was this belief that they were getting more, uh, leucine, which should build muscle and stronger. So, um, that's the sham. That's the, the lie, if you will. Um, and so one group did the cold water immersion, um, same protein shake. The other group thought they had extra leucine in their shake, but they just had the same protein shake. And then they went at it for these eight weeks. Um, to, to talk about some of the limitations, okay? Uh, and every study has them. So this isn't a critique of the authors per month, so much. Again, I don't do a lot of research um, because it's freaking hard. <laughs> like really well done research, like study, training studies like this take a lot of time. And uh, if you've you know, seen the author list on here, you can probably assume most of those people were helping in some way um, to run the study. It's a lot of manpower um, to do this. And so um, the, the first critique I have, though, and I know they randomize these people into groups, but if you look at the baseline measurements of um, the two groups, so you had the, the cold water immersion group and the sham group, the, um, the cold, they're the same age, same height, but the body mass of the sham group was 93.9 kilo plus or minus 16, where the cold water immersion group was 74.8. So you're talking about a 20 kilo s swing in, in the mean and in pretty good uh, variance there in the sham group. Now I, I'd rather see that variance potentially, um, than not because the average is so high, but that tells me that, um, there's some bigger people mixed in. So there might be some 74 kilo ish people, but there's probably some larger people as well. Um, and so you keep that in mind, lean mass, 70 kilo in the, in the sham group, 56, almost 57 kilo in the cold water. So you have a more muscular group. Could they be more type two fiber? Possibly. Um, the strength ratio, this was a good measurement, though. Strength ratio, 4RM to lean mass, was about the same, 2.2 versus 2.4. So you have m more muscular people in the sham group. Um, th their current strength levels, at least, are comparable to the cold water group. But with more lean mass, are they going to be more predisposed to gain muscle mass, right? Um, I don't know. 
right? I don't, I can't answer that, but I'm just looking at this. That's a, that's something that would concern me. The other part of this is 13 people. Uh, and so if you look and they, they reported the raw data, which is cool. I always like to see the raw data. Um, you know, that's not a lot of people per group, right? That's a pretty low, a low group, right? And I, um, you know, in terms of powered, uh, I didn't go look at G power and see if this was a powered study, but I would wager it probably wasn't. Um, but I, I could be wrong, but just something to keep in mind. It wasn't a large study. Now those are critiques. This is hard. Like if you randomly select people and you get this random, <laughs> the two big people get in the same group, then yeah, it's going to pull the mean around. I'm um, talking about the body mass and lean mass. Um, you know, getting 13 people to do a training study for eight weeks where they lift weights and have all these things done to them and, and et cetera, have to record all this stuff. That's hard. So, you know, that's not a critique. And I'm like, oh, I can't believe you did this. It's like, just keep that in mind when you're looking through this research. Um, research is hard, especially when you're research. That's why people research rats because they don't have opinions and you can make more of them and, you know, you can harvest them. And that's just the reality of it. All right. So what happened? Was the was cold water immersion more beneficial um, to these measures I mentioned? So um, lean mass, there was no difference. Penation angle. And I'm talking about statistical significance. There's no difference between the groups is what I'm getting at. There was improvements over time. There was a time effect, um, but there wasn't a, uh, there wasn't a interaction, meaning the, 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 the cold water immersion appeared not to make any difference in these areas. A reactive strength index. So think of like ability to change direction and um, absorb eccentric forces. Um, isometric uh, peak force in newtons. Uh, rate of force development, 50 to 100. Uh, and then the, the later rate of force development, if you're not know, if you know what that is, I have a video on that. Um, the most important variable in sport is what I called it. And I would argue it is at least in field court sport athletes, not, not, maybe not darts, um, a hundred and 200, uh, newtons per second, uh, and the hundred, 100 and 200, I'm sorry. That's a late rate of force development. I lost my train of thought. And in the quarter squat four RM, um, again, there was a time effect, but over these baseline to mid, mid to post, not surprisingly, there was the greatest improvement in strength outcomes from, the strength section, the session was, was the four, first four sessions. Um, but there did not appear to be, um, both when, statistically, certainly, but also um, when looking at the, the just the numbers here, there wasn't a difference um, in the cold water immersion. And uh, even in the perceptive scores, whether that's soreness um, or uh, recovery perceived, right, all the again, this is a pretty cool study in the sense they, they, they did a lot of variables. Like they took on a lot of variables, I should say, um, a lot of dependent variables. And overall, it, cold water immersion does not, did not appear to offer any sort of um, benefit. And the authors um, got a little bold at the conclusion, the practical applications, and pulled another research and said, hey, you know, we don't think this cold water immersion is, does anything, but we don't think it may, it may actually be detrimental based on other research. Well, that, that's fair because that's what these other studies kind of pointed to. But I um, and the practical applications, I don't, I don't know if that's where that belongs, but um, I could argue that. I get what they're trying to say. They're just trying to say, hey, cold water immersion, right? People who hate cold water immersion really hate cold water immersion. I don't really like it. I used to be pretty kind of in that group, like hardcore anti. Um, but I, I think the more time you spend in this field, uh, the more you need to be careful with that because um, the old adage, of, and nobody knows what this means anymore unless you're from my generation or older, don't throw the baby out with the bathwater, which sounds terrible. In other words, you know, when you throw the bathwater out, don't throw the baby out with it. Um, you got to get rid of the bathwater because it doesn't make any sense to keep it, but don't throw the baby out, right? Keep the baby. Um, so when I'm saying like cold water immersion, does it have, is there something important about it? Could it be useful? Yeah, it's a tool. It's a tool to be used at the right time. The way it has been used in the past, it's been a hammer for every, you know, let's use the hammer for every single circumstance. And that isn't effective, right? Um, and so this research is, is, is important because it says, hey, the best practice isn't to use colder water immersion, it appears. With the available evidence we see that's amassing. Cold water immersion is not an effective way, really, to reduce soreness, to improve athletic performance, um, to see muscle gains, et cetera. Now, keep in mind, these participants were also healthy volunteers. These weren't elite athletes or anything like that. Who knows if that applies to elite athletes? More than likely, um, this is my opinion now, more than likely, um, cold water immersion is a bad idea. Um, at the At the very best, it doesn't do anything, and you just feel a little cold at the worst it actually is detrimental to hypertrophy gains um, and so i would avoid it i would avoid cold water immersion for injury and and all the like um, uh, now contrast things and things like that, maybe i don't know um, but remember blood flow heals and blood flow builds so if we inhibit blood flow healing and building i'm not talking about like after an acl tear okay 
I'm not talking about a catastrophic injury. I'm talking about, you know, in these micro um, tears that we, the bros like to talk about, when we have these this damage that occurs in, in the micro level, the cytoskeleton of the muscle fiber, um, ice is not is likely not an effective way to to recover those that damage. If anything, blood flow would be better. I'd be interesting if they would have did uh, another group. And again, you're anytime you add, oh, let's just do this. Of course, that's so easy to do, right? It's like, hey, I'd just love to make a million dollars. Oh, that's so easy. Maybe for some of you. Um, if you could, let me know, and I'd like to make a million dollars too. Um, but add a, uh, an active group. And there was a couple studies I've done this that actually looked at warming or another, other um, you know, modes that would promote blood flow. Um, and blood flow usually wins. So anyway, I hope you found that helpful. I know I left out a lot of details on this one. If you want to go take a look at it yourself, please do. Um, I just thought it was an interesting study looking at this cold water immersion kind of pile of research that's been accumulating now for a while uh, to support this idea that it's not as effective as as many times has been portrayed. And I think for the most part, that's starting to weave its way at least through the college ranks uh, in American athletics. But I see it used quite a bit. I mean, I even saw a high-level weightlifting coach tell his weightlifter you know, um, get in the ice tub and he'd never done it before. And it was like, I told you it's awesome. It's like, well, he was, the kid was probably right. Like, don't put him in the cold tub. Um, so anyway, um, I'll see you in the next video. And again, like this video if you liked it.